Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. Shabbat Shalom. So good to see all of you here this morning. And uh, we're going to do something different. I sent an email out uh, to people. And I think everyone in this room probably got it because I recognize uh, I've got those emails uh, in the list. And uh, it's interesting that uh, this morning um, a brother reached out to me. I haven't uh, talked to him in around 20 years or so, I think. And uh, he got my he got our uh, service email. And we used to do um, Torah studies with, with him. And, and really, uh, it was three houses, my house, then Brother James, and then Jack's house. And we would rotate like that, and we would go through the Torah portion uh, as we plan to do today. Now, um, obviously, uh, this isn't something we plan to do every week, but I thought it would be good, especially this particular Torah portion, because there's a lot of details in here that I think are very useful and needful uh, for the people out there. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm planning to record this and then edit it and get it out for public uh, consumption. But uh, what I'm going to be using is the World English Bible, which uses the set-apart name Yahweh. Uh, now, it's not too Hebraicized because our audience, our target audience, is going to be people who may not know anything about some of the terms uh, that we use. And so we're going to try to stick as closely to English as possible, with the exception of using the name. Uh, so that's why I've got that up here. What I thought the format could be is um, maybe uh, page by page, or maybe uh, we could do like 20 verses at a time and then discuss or something like that. Maybe section by section. You'll see that I have these broken up into sections. Let me see if we can get it. There we go. Uh, so basically, this would be one section, for example. Uh, and then... Um, then we would come here and there would be like like maybe a paragraph or something, uh, except for the smaller one. Then maybe we could put that together down down with that. You know, we'll just kind of uh, go along how we can. And there may be more than one reader that may wish to. Uh, it may wish to, you know, um, read. So if you would like to be one of the readers. I don't like putting people on the spot, but, you know, type in, uh, yeah, I'll read, or reader here, or something, in the chat uh, right now, and we will get you guys listed, uh, and we'll rotate whoever wants to be the reader. So I'll be a reader. Um, and so uh, I, how we used to do it long ago... Uh, thank you, Brother James. Uh, Brother James is going to be a reader then, so we got two readers now. Uh, and then how we used to do it, Brother James and Brother Clore and, and then everybody else that joined our Michigan group, uh, we would go through a section, we would read it, and then we would discuss it. And sometimes sections have more to discuss than others. Uh, thank you, Donna. It's a third reader. Thank you for that. All right, so we've got... Uh, uh, myself, Brother James, and Don and Bob. All right. Now, uh, there's a lot here. This is the blessing and the cursing chapter. And much of this relates to the sad and uh, greatly declining condition of what was once a Judeo-Christian nation, but is quickly approaching uh, well, the only thing I could compare it to would be the apex of the Roman, or, or rather the decline of the Roman Empire. Thank you, Helen. That's all right. Uh, no problem. Uh, may Yahweh help you get those. If I know you're having, you're struggling with your eyesight. May Yahweh help you. Hashem Yehushua HaMashiach Sar Shalom. So, um, basically, um, we're going to see some things in here that do apply to us. In fact, honestly, I think in one way or another, just about everything uh, in the scriptures apply to us in some way, but you'll definitely see critical application in this particular section of scripture. 
So uh, now, um, some of you may already know uh, that follow the um, that follow the uh, Torah portion schedule. That each Torah portion for every Sabbath has a particular name, and this one is Re, which means uh, and he saw uh, or to see. Uh, so uh, this is an interesting one uh, because it has to do with uh, when uh, the the warnings that were given to the people when they finally got in the promised land and the warnings to stay away from certain things and to embrace other things. So I guess what we'll do is I will begin uh, with this section here. And then at the next page, we'll split it up between uh, Brother James and Sister Donna and Bob. Okay, so uh, this is the blessing and the curse. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 11. And this will go for a few chapters. Uh, and I do have the citations on just about every page, I believe. So you should be able to follow along. Uh, okay, uh, so and yes, uh, Brother James, if you wanted to just read out of the ISR, that's fine too. And, you know, it uses the name and it, it does plenty of English. So I think people can reasonably understand the ISR. All right, uh, let's see here. So uh, here it is. And... Um, we're starting with Deuteronomy chapter 11. I'm going to read from 26 and so on here. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I command you today. And the curse, if you do not listen to the commandments of Yahweh your God. But turn away out of the way, which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. It shall happen when Yahweh your God brings you into the land that you go to possess, that you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Aren't they beyond the Jordan, behind the way of the going down of the sun in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the Arabah near Gilgal? beside the Oaks of Moray. So this was a particular location that our Heavenly Father wanted the Israelites to go to and pronounce these blessings and curses. For you are to pass over the Jordan to go in to possess the land which Yahweh your God gives you, and you shall possess it and dwell in it. You shall observe to do all the statutes and the ordinances which I set before you today. Now, uh, here is a picture here. This is actually a picture of these two mountains. So look at how Shechem is in the middle. Remember, the Shechem has quite a bit of notoriety in the book of Genesis, uh, which was the place where, remember, Dina had been defiled by a prince of Shechem, and uh, how uh, Levi, and I think, um, help me out here, Brother James, if you remember, was it Lillian. Say Simeon. that. Again. Did you get it? Simeon. Um, Le yeah, I know the two sons of Israel that went and took vengeance on Shechem, uh, Levi, and then uh, who was the other one, guys? Help me out. I'm a little rusty. I, th I think Brother James is right. I think it's Levi and Simeon. That sounds right. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Brother James. <laughs> Levi and Simeon, that's right. I rem I'm reminded now. So uh, you notice Shechem here in the middle. Now look look at Mount Gerizim, the blessings, and over here is Mount Ebal, the curses. Uh, so this is very interesting. Uh, you know, in a lot of what the Torah has, is there's a lot of visual kinds of things that Moses or Joshua were leading the people into because... When you're doing and you're visual and you're, you're in a location, uh, it tends to seep in better than just telling, you know. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, the blessing and the cursing. All right. So any comments on this so far? Just well, I would like to, uh, to draw attention to uh, the fact that we see here a blessing and a curse. 
If we refer back to verse one of this chapter, it says, you shall love Yahweh your Elohim and guard his charge, even his laws and his right rulings and his commands always. And if we refer also into verse eight, it says, and you shall guard every command which I command you today so that you are strong and you shall go in and you shall possess the land which you are passing over to possess. So possession meant obedience. Yeah, it was predicated on obedience, wasn't it? Yeah. Isn't that something? It reminds me of other places in the scriptures that talk about when disobedience occurs to such a grave level, strangers will come into your land and they will become the head. And you who are the natural inhabitants of the land or those who are the inheritors of the land originally become the tail, meaning that strangers, i.e. immigrants, will get more benefits than the people who were born here. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of themes like that to think about. Okay, uh, let's see here. All right, so let's, uh, how about we do, uh, Brother James, uh, verse 1 through, and come down here, and then, uh, let's see, 1 to 12, how about we do that, and we'll do, that'll be a section, and we can discuss that. That works for me. <clears throat> These are the statutes and the ordinances which you shall obey to do in the land which Yahweh your Elohim of your fathers has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall surely destroy all the places in which the nations that you shall dispossess serve their elves, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall break down their altars, dash their pillars in pieces, and burn their Asheroth poles in, with fire. You shall cut down the engraved images of their Elohim, and you shall destroy their names out of that place. You shall not do so to Yahweh Elohim, but to the place which Yahweh Elohim shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, you shall seek his habitation and you shall come there. You shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the wave offering of your hand, your vows, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock there. There you shall eat before Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall rejoice in all that you put your hand to, you and your households, in which Yahweh your Elohim has blessed you. You shall not do all the things that we do here today, every man whatever is right in his own eyes, for you haven't yet come to the rest or to the inheritance which Yahweh your Elohim gives you. But when you go over the Jordan, and dwell in the land which Yahweh your Elohim causes you to inherit. And he gives you rest from all your enemies around you, so that you dwell in safety. Then it shall happen that to the place that Yahweh your Elohim shall choose to cause his name to dwell there, there you shall bring all that, all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the wave offering of your hand, and all your choice vows which you vow to Yahuwah. And you shall rejoice before Yahuwah your Elohim, you and your sons, your daughters, your female, your male servants and your female servants, and the Levite who is within your gate, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you. Yeah, a lot of things in there. Um, you know, there's only one group of people I know that are actually keeping this commandment. Not even the Jews are keeping this commandment about breaking down these engraved images of other gods. There's only one group I know, and they're, uh, they're not even Jews or Christians. They're the uh, radical Islamists, like ISIS and so on. You see them in the news sometimes. They go in and they destroy these idols that, uh, you know, have been erected, and they're pounding them out with hammers and whatnot, and, you know, grinding them to dust. Isn't that interesting that, that, that um, you know, and, and, you know, Islam is at least part of the children of Abraham, 
via Ishmael and the Confederacy with Esau. So that tells you that Abraham had a very deeply instilled instinct um, that was developed. And if we read the book of Jubilees and, and if, you know, I don't put a whole lot of stock in Jasher, but it's an, it's an interesting narrative that seems to correlate much of what Genesis talks about. But Abraham came from a, a house of rank idolatry. His father, Terah, was an idolater. And Terah wasn't an idolater because he really believed in idolatry. He was doing so because Nimrod basically would kill anyone who didn't go along with idolatry and didn't put idolatry up. So um, uh, here is the uh, this commandment to break down these images, which is the very same thing that Abraham did in his father's house, uh, and then carried on that. And that's one of the things that got the notice of Yahweh Elohim. And that Yahweh Elohim then began to communicate to Abraham and said, I will bless you and be with you. I will I will lead you and your your descendants will inherit this land of milk and honey. And uh, this is a critical component, but I've not seen anybody and other than, you know, the mention, um, you know, these Islamic people, which obviously they are connected to Abraham. Uh, that's one thing I noticed here. And so a lot of this is predicated, the idea of dwelling safely which Yahweh causes you to inherit it. And, and the fact that he's going to give you rest from all your enemies round about. The powerful thing there. Uh, Donna, go ahead. You got your hand up. Yes, I, I uh, in my heart, I, I wish we could do that here in America, uh, destroy these, these things. Um, and, and also just to see that Israel has allowed that mosque on the Temple Mount uh, is it just shows how far away they've gotten from this law, mm -hmm. but um, that's all. Yeah, and also notice that remember there was a a um, in fact, Brother James probably is aware, along with me, that Catriel went was in Israel. And he got put in a mental asylum because he went in and destroyed some idols uh, in Israel, in a museum. They, these were rank pagan idols. And um, he, he was a, a fellow who used to come to our, to our meetings. And he was in the news. And isn't that something uh, in Israel? So... Uh, uh, you know, uh, but he was following this this instruction. And then you think about that man who is in jail because he uh, broke down that bafflement. Uh, you know, the bafflement uh, satanic thing that I, I mentioned. Uh, and also, as an additional note, before we carry on, we're going to carry on with Don on the second half, if there's no more comments on this, but uh, Yehosef, I see also you would like to be a reader, so it'll go me, Brother James, Don and Bob, and Yehosef, if you'd like to read. All right, so any other any other comments on this section? Okay, uh, Donna and Bob, uh, 13 down to the end. Be careful that you don't offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see but in the place where Yahweh chooses in one of the, your tribes that you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. <clears throat> Yet you may kill and eat meat within all your gates after all the desire of your soul, according to Yahweh, your, your God's blessing, which he has given you. The unclean and the clean may eat of it, as of the gazelle and the deer. Only you shall not eat the blood. You shall pour it out on the earth like water. You may not eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or of your new wine or of your oil or the firstborn of your herd or of your flock nor any of your vows which you vow nor your free will offerings nor the wave offering of your hand. But you shall eat them before Yahweh your God in the place which Yahweh your God shall choose you your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, and the Levite who is within your gates, you shall rejoice before Yahweh your God in all that you hand to 
Be careful that you don't forsake the Levite as long as you live in your land. It's interesting that the place, the place that Yahweh chooses is of particular importance to him. That's something I notice here, which per perhaps carries into other teaching that we may have heard in these rooms regarding Zion uh, and its importance, especially in the end of time. That's my thought. Other comments? Now, I would like to add, too, that um, in our Messianic age, we've been told that wherever two or three of us are gathered together, there Elohim has placed his name. So no longer do we have an altar. No longer do we have the temple where we can go to because we are in diaspora. But that day of restoration is coming. We will return to the land. We will return to a temple and to an altar. And from there, we will put down our sacrifices, our vows, and come before Yah for his feasts and for his Shabbat. Hallelujah. Yeah, Brother James, uh, that's absolutely correct, especially in the millennial reign. And this causes a, a no small amount of consternation to church, uh, church taught people to know that there's scriptures, there's prophecies that seem to indicate when Yeshua returns and inaugurates this thousand year reign, they're still bringing peace offerings. They're still bringing certain types of offerings to. Uh, now, I don't know whether it's going to be an altar or a full temple. Uh, there's some bit of dispute on that, but you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Any other thoughts? All right. Uh, let's carry on here. And I guess uh, Yehosef uh, is volunteered to read. Uh, Yehosef, how about you read um, 20 down to 28? Yes, thank you. When Yahweh your God enlarges your border, as he has promised you, and you say, quote, I want to eat meat, unquote, because your soul desires to eat meat, that, no, you may eat meat after all the desire of your soul. If the place in which Yahweh your God shall choose to put his name is too far from you, then you shall kill your kill of your herd and of your flock, which Yahweh has given you, as I have commanded you, and you may eat within your gates after all the desire of your soul. Even as the gazelle and the deer is eaten, so you shall eat of it. The unclean and the clean may eat of it alike. Only be sure that you don't eat the blood, for the blood is the life. You shall not eat small wording i'm trying to go from one side to the other you shall not eat the life with the meat you shall not eat it you shall pour it out on the earth like water verse 25 you shall not eat it that it may go well with you and your children after you when you do not no when you do that which is right in Yahweh's eyes. Only your holy thing, which you have, and your vows, you shall take and go to the place which Yahweh has shall choose. You shall offer your burnt offerings, and the meat and the blood, on, Yah on Yahweh your God's altar. The blood of your sacrifices shall be poured out on Yahweh your God's altar, and you shall eat the and you shall eat the meat. Last verse for me, uh, twenty-eight. 
observe and hear all these words which I commanded you, that it may go well with you and with your children after, after you forever when you do that which is good and the right, which is good and right in Yahweh your God's eyes. Okay, thank you, brother. Uh, notice right off the bat, one of the most critical elements, and I will mention that in the book of Acts, where the apostles are basically making the determinations on what the bare minimum is for Gentiles to come into the assembly, notice that one of those four categories is not to eat blood, not to consume blood. Why? Well, if you look at every satanic, voodoo, uh, horrible, uh, you know, paganism, they made a custom of eating blood because it was believed that you would imbibe spiritual power by consuming blood, you see. And this opened them up to demons. In fact, Satan has consumed blood regularly because it literally puts demons in them, and they gain power by this. And so this was something that our father, Yahweh, strictly uh, said you shall not do. And even with, with very severe, um, you know, you'll be cut off. You'll be cut off from your children if you don't follow this one. This is a biggie. Uh, Brother James, go ahead. Yeah, so I just want to make a couple of comments here. First, in the, um, in the American Indian tribes, it was very customary to take a, a, um, a victim who showed a lot of bravery, who was a good, a, a hard fighter, to cut out his heart and eat it raw. Also, the drinking of the blood was very common among them. <clears throat> so this was a custom that had run over from all of these pagan um, religions of the past. Another thing that I would like to mention is the DNA is in our blood. And so I think this is one of the things that we are to refrain from is having uh, as partaking of that DNA. And so I would wonder if when we get blood transfusions, if such uh, transfusion is is even part of that. It's something I wondered about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing is that I would uh, uh, say with regard to the difference in that is that that is that plasma is. Um, I mean, it's been it's it's it has uh, it's it's laid dormant. It hasn't. Uh, you know, another it's not it's like you're drinking it directly, but but it is in other words after a something's been slaughtered, you know. Um, right. and, and that's one of the reasons why it makes me wonder on this, because um we know that the life is in the blood, and the that plasma is what pro, uh protected your life. Mm -hmm. And so again, this is why it causes a, a consternation in me as far as what we are allowed, as far as that blood. Yeah, and interestingly enough, there are groups that will, you know, they, they uh, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they will not have blood transfusions, although I think, who knows, maybe if it's, you know, really is a life or death matter, they'll, they'll not, uh, they'll, 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 you know, knuckle under and partake just to save life, but uh, that's uh, it is it is something that's caused me question too, brother. Uh, Yehosef, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, the second part there of verse twenty-two, I was kind of almost set back while reading that myself, where it says the clean and the unclean. I guess I read it and I was almost uh, stumbling over it because I wasn't. I was almost in disbelief of reading it that he's saying to be able to eat the unclean and the clean together. I don't know. Is there something that, uh, well, is that, is that surprise anybody else? Well, what he's saying there is that the ceremonially, uh, the ceremonially 
unclean person. It's not that he's saying they may eat unclean meat. It's he's talking about the people, the unclean and the clean may eat it alike. In other words, it's speaking of the people who are eating, because there may be ceremonially unclean people that um, are in the in the uh, crowd. There's all kinds of things in Torah that make someone ceremonially unclean. Thank you. That makes more sense after after going through that. It it kind of set me back as I was reading it because I wasn't wasn't expecting to read that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Hallelujah. All right. Great comments, guys. Great comments. Okay. So I think it's uh, full circle again. It's my turn again. I'll do uh, 29 uh, to finish this up here. Okay, so um, it carries on here in verse 21. When Yahweh your Elohim cuts off the nations from before you, where you go and to dispossess them, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, be careful that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods? I will do likewise. You shall not do so to Yahweh, your Elohim, for every abomination to Yahweh, which he hates, they have done to their gods, for they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever thing I command you, that you shall observe to do, uh, whatever thing I command you, that you shall observe to do, you shall not add to it, nor take away from it. And I think uh, uh, we could look at churchianity takes away from it. Judaism adds to it. Can you see that? I'll say it again. Churchianity takes away from it. Judaism adds to it. Judaism adds, uh, Judaism uh, adds extra hedges and they add things. Okay. Brother James. Right. Judaism adds to it through the Talmud, which actually puts a fence around the Torah rulings and makes it harder for people to keep those Torah rulings. Also, um, I think what we need to recognize here, too, is this is actually a condemnation of the Christian churches because they do practice these things. They they follow what has been transferred over from paganism through the RCC and into the daughters of the Protestant churches today. Yeah. And one last thing I want to comment about here is in verse 31, where it says, and they have done to their gods, for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire of their gods. Do you know where most of the aborted fetuses go? They go into a furnace. They're burned, just like Moloch. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good point. I didn't know that. Or they sell them and, and use the parts for horrific experiments, which they turn into shots that they want to shoot into everybody's arm. Uh, you know, there's just no, uh, there's no end to the evil of what they do with this. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Um, well, when we talk about Easter and eggs and bunnies, did that come from Holy Writ? No. In fact, even the Venerable Bede in England acknowledged that the reason why the Catholic Church and then the Protestant churches uh, acquiesced to the pagan nations around them is because they were trying to get the gospel into the pagan nation. So instead of being a good uh, a good example to the pagans, they figured they would lower themselves to their level. And just so that they, you know, mouth the word, the name of the Messiah, and so on. Uh, but that you're right. It is an absolute violation of this because... It says, be careful you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed before you, and that you uh, do not inquire of their gods. Uh, Brother James, go ahead. 
Yes, well, you mentioned about how evil our generations have become. And we know that the day of wrath is predicated on the fulfill, uh, fulfilled cup of wrath that Abba Yah has. So how much fuller will that cup be? Um, it has to overrun here soon, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, Brother James is our next reader. Uh, how about uh, verse 1 down to 9? That's that uh, nice good section there. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, let's go after other Elohims, which you have not known, and let's serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or to that dreamer of dreams, for Yahweh your Elohim t is testing you to know whether you love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after Yahweh your Elohim, fear him, keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and cling to him. That prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken rebellion against Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to draw you aside out of the way which Yahweh your Elohim commanded you to walk in, so you shall remove the evil from among you. If your brother, the son of your mother, or your son or your daughter, or the wife of your bosom, or your friend who is your own soul, entices you secretly, saying, Let's go and serve other elves, which you have not known, you nor your fathers, of the elves of the people who are around you, near to you or far from you, from the one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent to him, nor listen to him, neither shall your eye pity him, neither shall you spare, neither shall you conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first on him to put him to death, and afterwards the hands of the, all the people you shall stone him to death with stones, because he has sought to dwell you away from Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. All Yisrael shall hear and fear, and shall not do any more wickedness like this among you. Yeah, I have a question on this uh, first section you read with regard to the whole Q thing. Remember these Q anonymous people um were prophesying that Trump would get a second term after his first term. Now, they get around it now at first, you know, but when Biden won, you know, they kind of um you know, I felt like, okay, are they fulfilling this? But it'll be interesting to see because they got around that by saying, oh well, it, the prophecy didn't say we didn't prophesy that it would be in succession. See? So that's something I thought about, but notice this here, it says here that if you have somebody prophesying that is not following him or keeping his commandments, then that prophecy really isn't of any kind of effect or powerful effect. Uh, so you think about Balak and Balaam, you know? Uh, Balak kept trying to get Balaam, which, by the way, Balaam was a soothsayer to curse Israel. But neither Balaam nor Balak were keeping the commandments of Elohim. Uh, we know that by various other sources, but uh, just some things I thought about there. Brother James. Yes, well, it was my understanding that um, this group, cult, whatever it is, called Q, um, are they not following uh, their sh Shema, the, the uh, Buffalo Man? It seems to me as though that that was their head, the person that they were following, um, his teachings, his instructions. Now, I might be wrong on that, but that was my understanding. But nonetheless, um, I've never put any stock into those kind of people. In the first place, I don't put stock into any teacher 
unless they absolutely use the Father's name, because that is a Torah commandment. We are not to bring his name to vain. Um, it's just sad that, that the Christian church has changed that reading to such that it says um, that they are not to uh, make, uh, use it in, in vain. Uh, that's not what it says. It's to bring it to vanity, to bring it to nothingness. And, and like I say, it's just a shame that the uh, Christian churches have taught us not to use that name in that way. Yeah, and, and uh, the only time they use half of it is when they say hallelujah, but they don't even know what that means. Uh, and in fact, a lot of pastors don't even know what that means. I've asked pastors who are supposed to be educated. They, they have to go look it up or ask somebody that knows. Uh, but and, and that's only half of the name, but that's the only time. But the rest of the time, they're following a tradition of the Jews, which um, which was basically, um, you know, as my study has borne out, they it grew out of a misplaced wanting to add extra hedges when they went into Babylon, and they were laughed at and called uh, yahoos uh, for using the proper name of our father. That's one explanation I've heard. I don't know if that really has legitimacy. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't there, so I don't know. But that's one explanation I heard. Uh, but that, that, that that carried on, uh, you know, and uh, this is why even in their Talmud, they have strict prohibitions against using the name uh, and, and curses for using the name. Uh, and then the, the Christian church, the uh, Pope, um, basically they followed the same tradition except for that rare moment. I think I talked about this at Midweek Manna where there were some charismatic Catholics that started using the name again and there were miracles that happened. Isn't that something? Miracles and the Pope got wind of it, and he put his fist down about it. He said, uh-uh, you are not to use that name, which is in contravention of what the Scripture says, that we are to use his name. So that's good points there. Um, a pretty, uh, pretty stern punishment for a so-called prophet who tries to lead them to other gods, uh, also in that section. Yeah. Ah, Ellen, I see that comment. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Donna and Bob, you guys have got that. Uh, go ahead, Donna, with that last section there. If you hear about one of your cities, which Yahweh, your God, gives you to dwell there, that certain wicked fellows have gone out from among you and have drawn away the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let's go and serve other gods, which you have not known. Then you shall inquire, investigate, and act diligently. Behold, if it is true, and the thing certain, that such abominations was done among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly with all that is therein, and its livestock with the edge of the sword. You shall gather all its plunder into the middle of its street, and shall burn with the fire the city with all the plunder to Yahweh your God. It shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. Nothing of the devoted thing shall cling to your hand, that Yahweh may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy, and have compassion on you and multiply you, as he has sworn to your fathers, when you listen to Yahweh, your God's voice, to keep all his commandments, which, com which I command you today, to do that which is right in Yahweh, your God's eyes. Yeah, isn't it interesting that even the stuff that they have of these inhabitants who are doing these abominations... Um, maybe even sacrificing their babies like the inhabitants of Jericho did, reputedly. Um, and, uh, you know, following other, other gods, which are demons, as we know, in the New Testament passages. Uh, even their stuff is to be burned. Now, uh, 
What is the reason for that? Because in occult religions, talismans is a real thing. It is a real thing. And uh, if you understand Satanism, you understand how witches operate, there are demons that affix themselves to possessions of these people. And they have legal right. And so uh, if an un un unknowing person, let's say if a missionary goes to Africa and, you know, just happens to stop in a shop and pick up something that looks innocuous, it looks, you know, innocent. But in fact, a witch doctor has pronounced a curse over that thing or put some kind of a spell on that thing. and a demon or demons then, and it turns into a talisman. Uh, even pieces of clothing, I could show you, pieces of clothing can hold power. Whether for, uh, well, in, in, in the, the uh, scriptural record, we see this mostly for demonic power. I speak of, uh, uh, there's, I think there's one thing where Nimrod got a hold of garments. Um, uh, but, at, but be that as it may, uh, it, whether to demonic or whether imbued with the spirit of Yahweh, we do see a couple instances now that I recall where a, a garment is imbued with the spirit of Yahweh or something's imbued with the spirit of Yahweh. See, things can have spiritual import. And so uh, this is why they, whereas in other cases, you'll see that they would be allowed to take the booty. But in these cases, when you have societies that are so deep, steeped in idolatry, our Heavenly Father gave instructions to destroy everything, burn it by fire. And we also think of how uh, when Paul preached in a city in the New Testament, um, how, you know, they, they repented. I think it was Paul was preaching. They repented. I'm vaguely remembering this story. And what did they do? They took all of their wizardry scrolls, their books, their, their uh, clothing, their idols, and they and he told them to get them in the city square and burn them all, and they all converted to Yeshua Messiah. Okay, so that's 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 the reason. And there may be others, but that's my comment. Uh, go ahead, Brother James. Well, I think the uh, the garment reference that you were referring to uh, was that not the apron of um, Noah or on Adam that Nimrod had that he possessed. Yeah, and it seems to me is that as though that's what I remember reading. Yeah. But another thing I wanted to bring up is in uh, in verse fifteen, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword. What is a sword made of? Is it not iron? And what does our Mashiach come back bearing? A rod of iron. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see very just punishments given to those who refuse to obey. Yeah, it says that he will rule them with a rod of iron. And if you read in um, Zechariah 14, you know, there's punishments meted out. Like plague, like no rain that King Yeshua pronounces upon those nations, though those people groups that are still refusing to submit to him in one way or another. Donna and Bob, go ahead. You've got your hand up. Um, I have a, a personal example of, of uh, that sort of a, this applies to that I thought I would share. Uh, our oldest daughter um, w walked in the Messianic way for maybe 15 years with us uh, and enjoyed with it um, and then uh, converted to uh, Catholicism just a few years back. And... Uh, I've had to, and she's been trying to entice us to uh, step away from obeying Yahweh and to uh, listen to the Catholic teachings. So we've had to cut her off, um, basically, from family. And while we continue to pray for her to... Uh, against a spirit of confusion that we feel she has. But um, the edge of the sword that we're using is the word the word of Yahweh. So I've tried to counteract 
what she's trying to do with us, with the word of Yahweh as our sword, and then praying for her. But um, it's a death, basically, of, of one of our family members, uh, in a way. Yeah, I understand uh, that feeling, uh, sister, I tell you, and, and you probably know as well, uh, given my son, uh, the testimonies that I've shared about him. Uh, yeah, and that's very that's an interesting point. Using the sword of the word to cut through the falsehood, yeah, the the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of Elohim. Yeah, Joseph, go ahead, brother. Uh, thank you for sharing, Donna. Um, my dad is I consider myself a recovering Catholic, and uh, my dad at times will even go to funerals or things like that, which are but uh, he'll go to the Hillsdale, the Hillsdale Catholic Church, and I've noticed that they are doing things and singing songs in uh, Latin. I asked my dad, I said, do you know Latin? He goes, no. I said, well, do you even know what you're saying? I mean, if if you're if they're they're doing songs and things like that in Latin and you really don't even know uh, the words to the song, I I don't know. It's something that I observe. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, you know, and, and really you have to have the translation. Um, and there must be no, not even any translation there, no, in the literature or anything, it sounds like. Um, and remember uh, that in the Torah, it, it speaks of one uh, pure language. And that pure language is not Latin, it's Hebrew. Uh, now, it might not be the modern derivation, which has been affected by semantic change. It may very well be a primordial Hebrew, an original Hebrew. Uh, but there is a prophecy that says, when Yeshua returns, uh, the people will be turned back to a pure language that they may worship Yeshua with one consent in other words one unity um and it also you know, there's another prophecy that talks about and his name shall be one the name dispute will be solved uh now uh, you know, we uh, we think we've gotten it pretty close uh we kind of narrowed it down whether it's yahuwah or yahweh uh but uh king yeshua will make the final determination on exactly how the name is pronounced but that too uh, relative to language and thoughts. Brother James. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention, too, when you was talking about uh, restoring the language to the Hebrew lang uh, Hebrew tongue, um, when Shaul was on his way to Damascus to prosecute the, the believers, and he was struck down. If you read that, it says that Elohim spoke to him in the Hebrew tongue. Not in the Aramaic, which happens to be the language that was spoken in Israel at that time, but in the Hebrew, the restored tongue. That's a good point. Yeah, I didn't make that connection before, but you're right. Yeah, it, it, and, and when he spoke, it makes no sense for him to use a watered-down Hebrew. When he spoke, it must have been the original, and Paul must have been able to understand it. Isn't that something? I remember Paul was uh, of the Levitical family, so he would have had access to the ancient scrolls to know those uh, ancient words. Yeah, hallelujah. It's a good thoughts, guys. All right, uh, let's see here. Um, I think, uh, I think, did I do this? I think I did this last part, didn't I? Uh, who did this last part? Did I do it? I lost track of who's the next reader. <laughs> Help me out, guys. Uh, Donna did. Okay, Donna did. Okay, so then I think we go to Yehoshaph. Uh Yehoshaph, how about you do, uh, let's see here, verse 1 down to 8. I was able to expand out the, the screen a little bit, so I think I can, I'll try and do a little better. I'm not... <clears throat> you are the children of Yahweh, your Elohim. 
you shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. For you are a holy people of Yahweh, your God, Elohim. Your <clears throat> And Yahweh has chosen you to be a people for his own possession above all peoples who are on the face of the earth. You shall not eat any abominable th abominable thing. These are the animals which you may eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roebuck, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the camaios. Every animal that parts the hoof and has the hoof split in two and choose the cud among the animals you may eat. Nevertheless, these shall not eat of them that chew the cud or of those who have the hoof split, the camel, the hare, and the rabbit, because they chew the cud, but don't part the hoof, they are unclean to you. The pig, because it has a split hoof, but doesn't chew the cud, is unclean to you. You shall not eat their meat. You shall not touch their carcasses. Hallelujah. Yeah, those two conditions have to be uh, visually evident. The split hoof and the manner of digestion which is chew the cud, which uh, infers that uh, maybe these animals have, uh, they are strictly herbivorous and they are grazing animals. And uh, so therefore the meat is considered healthier than say a garbage gut, which is basically a pig, uh, you know, and, and other kinds of things like the, the, um, the rabbit chews the cud, but it doesn't have the split hoof. It's got like claws and so on. Uh, that's interesting. Um, look at this thing up here, not cutting yourself, the baldness between your eyes for the dead. Many of these were pagan practices that they did. In fact, I remember the Egyptians would get rid of their eyebrows and they would have everything waxed down. And uh, it, it was in honor of their, it was a pagan ritual. Uh, so um, Yahweh, the whole intention here is to have his people as a set-apart people. Brother James. Well, I just wanted to go back to um, the, the, the animals that we are allowed to eat. If you'll notice, every one of them have four stomachs. Those four stomachs break down that food much better than one stomach. And so I think that is one of the reasons why these animals are clean, because they purify the food much better. They make their, the, the food that they eat to them is much more pure than what the, uh, the animals who are one stomach have. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, the the uh, manner of digestion is much more intense. And um, and you think about the chlorophyll and all the good things that are getting into that body uh, of those animals, you know, which, which engenders health. Okay, uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Uh, okay, I guess it's my turn. Uh, I'll finish up this here. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. You may eat whatever has fins and scales. You shall not eat whatever doesn't have fins and scales. It is unclean to you. For example, catfish has fins but no scales, and so on. There's many fishes like carp, same thing. Or of all clean birds you may eat, but these are they of which you shall not eat. The eagle, the vulture, the osprey, the red kite, the falcon, the kite of any kind, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the owl, the seagull the hawk of any kind, the little owl, the great owl, the horned owl, the pelican, the vulture, the cormorant, the stork, the heroine after its kind, uh, the heron after its kind, 
the hoopoe and the bat, all winged creeping things are unclean to you. They shall not be eaten. Of all clean birds you may eat. Okay. Um, interesting. Uh, that it actually lists these various categories. You shall not eat of anything that dies of itself. You may give it to the foreigner living among you. That's interesting idiosyncrasy, isn't it? Who is within your gates that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a holy people of Yahweh your Elohim. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Now, there's quite a bit in here. Uh, when you notice these uh, categories of birds, they are considered carrion birds for the most part. Uh, they'll eat anything uh, that runs on four feet, you know, or even slithers. They'll eat anything. Uh, so these kinds of birds are, you know, when you think about mice are unclean, the hawk, they go after mice all the time, so on. So the, these categories of a bird are not appropriate. Uh, and why are these here? Is it just because Yahweh decided up up above someday and said, uh, you know, this will be neat. I'll, I'll just distinguish my people arbitrarily by choosing these various animals. No, there is a reason to everything that Yahweh says. And it has to do with health. It has to do with engendering the most amount of health of his people. And then uh, the idea of not anything that not, does not die of itself, uh, you know, disease begins immediately at the time of death. Disease and um, degradation begins. But interestingly, in a foreigner, you can give it to a foreigner because apparently they're already unclean and they're going to eat unclean anyway. So uh, that's kind of an idiosyncrasy there, isn't it? I've often wondered about that little part where Yahweh allows that uh, to go to these people who are unholy. They're, they're, they're not set apart. Uh, and then this other thing here, the Jews, at the very end, you shall not boil a young goat in his mother's milk. The Jews take this to mean, they go, they put extra fences uh, where they say you shall not have meat with cheese. In fact, in Israel... Many of the more well-off people have two refrigerators. One is strictly for meat. The other is strictly for dairy. Did you know that? And it's because of extra fences they put around this. But really, I think what this means is uh, having to do with destroying the familial connection to where, and it's, and it's and, you know, the uh, Yahweh hates the idea of young, the defenseless, having anything to do with the blame, in other words, uh, the mixing of, you know how um, like many mothers today are basically in essence uh, putting their children in the fires of Moloch, so to speak. Brother James mentioned that. Well, here's a mother and her young, you see. It's a principle here that Yahweh uh, detests. And maybe because within Satanism, maybe because within these occultic religions, they do that all the time. It's part of their religion because Satan Satanism, occultism, demands this kind of horrific sacrifice, you know. Uh, okay, so I think Yehoshaphat was up and then James. Uh, if we might talk some of the, about the terms first, uh, I was curious of what, what a cormorant is. I was wondering even about the sandhill crane, whether it fits into that unclean category of terms there and names, I wondered. Yeah, the sandhill crane, I think, would be considered unclean. The cormorant, now there's actually people who claim that the cormorant is, is part in the chicken, but uh, Brother James and I have searched that out and found that not to be true. But... Um, that's, yeah, uh, there are some uh, names there, a particular uh, fowl that are somewhat curious. You know, they're not your everyday names. Brother James. Yes, well, when you was mentioning about the uh, the familial character of, uh, um, of this command not to boil a, a young goat in its mother's milk, um, another thing along that same line was, if you found a nest 
you is not to take the mother and the eggs. You is to leave one or the other uh, so that you is not destroying that family line. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I forgot about that one. But yeah, yeah, that's in another place of Torah. All right. Okay, uh, I think. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay, so um, I think is it Donna that's up now? Or Brother James, who's up now? Did you read? I need to keep a better. Oh, yeah. Joseph. Okay, is that you? Yes. Which one is it? I'm going to have to have somebody dedicated to figuring out who goes next because, see, I get myself wrapped up in the material and I forget what the line of readers is. <laughs> okay, so whoever the next reader is, uh, 22, I'm going to finish this part here. Yeah. Let's see. I believe it's you, brother. Oh, is it? Okay, all right. Maybe that's why I'm confused. Uh, I'm getting, I'm getting up there, guys. All right, all right. So uh, you shall surely uh, tithe all the increase of your seed, that which comes out of the field year by year. Okay, interesting. You shall eat before Yahweh your Elohim in the place who which he chooses to cause his name to dwell. The tithe of your grain, of your new wine, and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock, that you may learn to fear Yahweh your Elohim always. If the way is too long for you so that you are not able to carry it because of the place which Yahweh your Elohim shall choose to set his name there is too far from you, when Yahweh your Elohim blesses you, then you shall turn it into money. Bind up the money in your hand and shall go to the place which Yahweh your Elohim shall choose. You shall trade the money for whatever your soul desires, for cattle or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink. Or for whatever your soul asks of you, you shall eat there before Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. You shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he has no portion nor inheritance with you. Now at the end of every three years, you shall bring all the tithe of your increase in the same year, and shall store it within your gates. The Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, as well as the foreigner living among you. Isn't that something? The fatherless and the widow who are within your gates shall come and shall eat and be satisfied. So he always concerned about the foreigner, assuming that the foreigner is committed to keeping the commandments and not running amok. Uh, that's the problem we have in this country. That Yahweh your Elohim may bless you in all the work of your hand, which you do. Okay. Brother James. Do you have a comment there, Brother James? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't get my, uh, I hit my mute button, but it, it didn't unmute. So anyhow, um, the last two verses there that you read are very significant and something that it seems very few people actually understand. Let's read this slowly here. At the end of every three years, you bring all the tithes of your increase in the same year and so store it within your gates. Okay, so you're not giving your tithe as you get those tithe, as you get your income. You are storing it up. But now this is every three years. This is talking about a third tithe. Now I've had a lot of people say, how in the world can anybody afford 30% of their income to give it away? Well, it's not actually a third of your income because look at it. It's every third year. You're collecting that third tithe. That third tithe has a very specific use. The Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, as well as the foreigner who lives among you, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates. So these are for those who are poor. This is the, uh, dare I say, welfare program that Abba Yah has declared. If, as a nation, we practice that today, there would be no poverty that would be devastating to families. If we practice that very thing today, it would be such a different nation. But we have gone so far 
from understanding the Torah. And we have got to get back to living that way. We will get back, in fact, because Abba Yah will bring us back to these times. Yeah, uh, you know, and I think in, in, uh, when you're figuring it out, it's a tenth of a tenth on some of these. Uh, some of these things. Isn't that correct? Uh, when you're talking about the second and third tithe, in other words, you're taking a certain amount off of the tenth uh, and so on. But even if even if it is a full 30%, I mean, the government's charging 50% and very little of that goes to the people right, right now. It's going to other nations to fight geopolitical wars and, you know, the roads are going bad and, uh, you know, the people are languishing. So Yahweh's ways are truly better. Uh, that's, that is um, absolutely right. Um, okay, so um, I think Brother James got the next part there. Put it here. <clears throat> okay. At the end of every seven years, you shall cancel debts. This is the way it shall be done. Every creditor shall release that which he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not require payment from his neighbor and his brother because Yahweh's release has been proclaimed. Of a foreigner, you may require it, but whatever is yours is with your brother, your hand shall release. However, there will be no poor with you, for Yahweh will surely bless you in the land which Yahweh your Elohim gives you for an inheritance to possess. If only you diligently listen to Yahweh your Elohim's voice to observe to do all his commandments, which I command you today, for Yahweh your Elohim will bless you as he promised you. You will lend to many nations, but will not borrow. You will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. How far we are from that today. Yeah, it's totally inverted today. We owe China billions of dollars and we're barely able to pay off the interest. We're not even touching the principal. Uh, and so truly we have become as the tail and they've become as the head because of a departure from these principles found in the scriptures. Go ahead, Donna. Uh, this can be applied by us with family or we have loans out to anybody. Um, I guess the my difficulty was trying to determine which year was actually the Shemitah. Any thoughts on that, Brother James? Yeah, um, this is one of the things that bothered me years ago, and I have come to the conclusion that we should begin our seven-year count from that time when Yah has blessed us with wisdom and understanding of his word to accept his Torah. Um, and until the true Shemitah can be restored, um, it, it's it's. It's anybody's guess which year it actually is. We uh, the Jews lost lost the count of it, and you can go to uh, two or three different um, organizations, Jewish organizations, and they will all give you a different timing for this. So, my best advice is to figure that time from the time of your calling, the time that you repented and received his Ruach HaKadosh. Yeah, and uh, you know, um, that's a good that's a good advice there. Uh, and, and notice that and here you have, it's almost like the conditions where they were lost time in Egypt. Even the Jews haven't, uh, haven't retained it. Uh, but Remember that when they came out of Egypt, it was given to Moses, this shall be the beginning of months to you, and then you shall count two weeks, essentially, and then Passover. It's almost like Yahweh gave them, by divine inspiration, the proper time 
when they came out. So is it possible that he shall do so again in the second Exodus? I think so. I think so. Go ahead, Brother James. Yeah, what I would like to do is just remind everybody we are in diaspora and we do not have a true Torah teacher except for the Ruach HaKadosh. That alone is our teacher. So as the Ruach leads you, so should you follow. We do not want to grieve the Ruach. If we grieve the Ruach, it will leave us. So as that Ruach leads you, follow it. And if you're in the wrong in, in any way, it will, the Ruach will bring you back to the truth. And again, we will be restored true knowledge and understanding one day. But what we are living right now is practicing as best as we understand of keeping the Torah. Right. Practice makes perfect. And then we'll we'll have, at least we'll have the basics down when it comes for that divine inspiration moment. We won't be starting at zero. As uh, long as we're showing a heart of obedience, we will be blessed for that. Yes, I believe so. Baruch Hashem. Okay. All right. I think we've got Donna up again. Uh, how about we do, uh, let's do this. Go ahead and do this section here, Donna. If a poor man, one of your brothers, is with you within any of your gates in your land, which Yahweh your God gives you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand from your poor brother. But you shall surely open your hand to him and shall surely lend him sufficient for his need, which he lacks. Beware that there not be a wicked thought in your heart, saying, the seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry to Yahweh against you, and it be a sin to you. You shall surely give, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because it is for this thing Yahweh your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you put your hand to. For the poor will never cease out of the land. Therefore I command you to surely open your hand to your brother, to your needy, and to your poor in your land. Yeah, notice it qualifies it by saying your poor brother. Uh, you ever seen these uh, news articles of these panhandlers that get out in these really busy street area, and then you find out they boast about making seventy or $80,000 a year just panhandling? Uh, so... There's a qualification here. It also reminds me of the Didache, uh, where there's instruction given to believers in Yeshua in the first century, uh, where it says, you know, let your alms sweat in your palm and ask the Father to, to know who to give it to. There's that thought I had as we were reading this. Uh, uh, and, um, and then finally, uh, that Yahweh is concerned about the powerless. And when you are poor, you lack power. And Yahweh, Yahweh likes to, to um, you know, where there's so much, there's so much extra, he likes to take some of that extra and transfer it to those who have nothing. Okay. Now that in some ways that sounds a little bit like communism, but in Yahweh's economy, it's not communism. It's love. It's love and concern. Yahweh has nothing to do with communism. Which is the forcible, the forcible uh, removing of resources and then giving to those who really are not worthy. Uh, this is an act of love based upon a love for the community, wanting everyone to at least have the basics. And that's what I see here. Brother James. Well, what I'm reminded of here is when the, um, when one of the rulers from the temple came out and asked the Mashiach, what is the greatest command? And he said to love Yah with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your being. And then he turned around and he said, and to love your brother as yourself. This is what gives us the ability to live in a life of communal living. It's not communism, it's love that will supremely rule. Yeah. Yeah, Baruch Hashem. 
Okay, uh, I think uh, we did Donna and then now oh, Yehosef. Uh, how about you do this section here, uh, 12 down to 18. Yes, I will. If your brother, uh, under the heading that says release of a Hebrew servant, if your brother, a Hebrew man, or a Hebrew woman is sold to you and serves you for six years, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. When you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, and out of your wine press. As Yahweh your Elohim ha has blessed you, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and Yahweh your Elohim redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this, I command you this thing today. It shall be if he tells you, quote, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your house. Uh, actually, I missed the unquote there. Quote, I will not go out from you, unquote, because he loves you and your house. Because he is well with you, then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. Also, your female servant you shall do likewise. It shall not seem hard to you when you let him go free from you, for he has been double the value of a hired hand as... He served you six years. Yahweh your Elohim will bless you in all that you do. Yeah, it's interesting that one of the most notable characters in the scriptures who violated this principle was Laban, who did everything he could to keep Jacob captive. Uh, and I noticed that where it says, this will not seem too hard for you to let him go free from you because, you know, Laban basically wanted... Uh, Jacob to labor as a indentured servant, which is really what this is talking about, indentured servitude, which is a limited amount of servitude, seven years, uh, which is something that the English uh, even did uh, for many people who wanted to make it across the ocean to the new world. And they then were had, had to labor for seven years, and they were at the end of seven years, they were expected to to be released, and then they could make their own way. Uh, and then, uh, interestingly enough, released not just empty-handed, because here is a man or a woman who has been dependent upon the um, the family head, the tribal head, and then just to dump them out with nothing that they can survive with, that's, that's wickedness too. You actually have to furnish them. Uh, so there's a lot of elements in here uh, that go into human relations uh, that we have to consider. Uh, and also this, this thing here where it says double the value of a hired hand. Well, because he's your brother. Because you're serving the same Elohim, you see. There's other places in Scripture that talk about when you go to war and you take over a nation, then you may uh, there, there may be slaves given to you. Well, uh, those there's those there are different regulations for that, but notice that they are of a pagan religion. Now, I've often wondered, well, what happens if they convert? If they could truly convert, does that then transform them into a Hebrew? And therefore, these commandments come into play, where it's not a lifetime servitude, uh, but rather an indentured servitude. Those are some thoughts, uh, you know, I've had. Uh, any other thoughts on that? Okay, all right. Um, let's see here. Uh, so we did... Uh, I, I do have a thought on uh, the previous uh, writing reading that we did when it, it mentioned about uh, the timing of the seven-year sa uh, um, forgiveness of debts that, uh, yeah, it was saying, even if you have uh, a brother that's asking for let's say a loan on let's say the sixth year 
it's saying, uh, you know, don't factor that in. That, uh, that's something to really consider too, that, that, uh, yeah, it, it would be, I mean, it's almost seemed like it would be uh second nature. You'd say, you know what, uh, it, it looks like you're trying to, to, to borrow money, knowing that there's a debt forgiveness coming and, you know, and, and the word says there to, uh, to not factor that in, um, any comments on that from others? Yeah, I noticed that too. And it, it really, that really strikes against the, uh, evil inclination, doesn't it? Uh, it really, uh, the father is trying to get the people to be more open-handed with one another. Go ahead, brother James. Well, I can't locate it right off hand, but there is a scripture that, um, gives the requirement that you are to figure out in, in that time period, let, let's say, um, let's say three and a half years into that, you decide to sell yourself in. Well, you is to figure how much that three and a half years is worth. Now this, this actually um, pertained to the land. If you, uh, if you purchased someone's land, uh, you were supposed to return it at the end of a certain time, okay? Well, if you bought it halfway into that time period, you had to compensate for that so that you would not give the full price of the land because if you bought it halfway in, you're never going to get the full value of that land back out again. So I, I'm i real sure that this, pertain, this, this carries over into selling yourself into slavery uh, but again, it may be that that seven years begins at the very time that that person comes into the household as a slave, not according to the Semita year. Yeah, and also, uh, I think what you're uh, mentioning there is Leviticus 27, starting in verse 16, if a man dedicate to Yahweh part of the land that is in his possession, then the valuation shall be in proportion to its seed, a omer of barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. If he dedicates his field from the year of Jubilee, the valuation shall stand. But if he dedicates his field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall calculate the price according to the years that remain until the year of Jubilee. And a deduction shall be made from the valuation. Is that what, kind of what you were getting at there? Now, that's exactly the one. The, I knew it was in Leviticus, but I, I can't turn to scriptures that quick. And I... I'm not uh, I'm not able to bring them up on my screen while doing this as well. All right. Hallelujah. Well, thank you for that, brother. OK, uh, so is it my turn again? Uh, am I getting this right? <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, let me just finish this last part here. Um, this has to do with firstborn animals. All right. You shall dedicate all the firstborn males that are born of your herd and of flock to Yahweh Elohim. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You shall eat it before Yahweh Elohim year by year in the place which Yahweh shall choose you and your household. Well, that has Passover uh, implication, doesn't it? If it has any defect, is lame or blind, or has any defect, whatever, you shall not sacrifice it to Yahweh Elohim. You shall eat it within your gates. The unclean and the clean shall eat it alike, as the gazelle and as the deer only you shall not eat his blood. You shall pour it out on the ground like water. Okay, uh, so the firstborn. A lot of this has imagery that goes back to the Exodus, goes back to the Passover, where, um, you know, you notice how Yahweh, of those who did not have the blood of the lamb on their, on their uh, doors, the, the lintel side of the doors or the above the door, uh, you know, they, they their uh, firstborn died. Uh, and I thought about that, you know, when that kind of thing uh, uh, there. Go ahead, Brother James. Okay, again, um, I'm sure this is in Leviticus, but um, it does say that the firstborn of everything is to be dedicated to Yah. Now, if it was a firstborn of a clean animal, it was to be sacrificed. If it was the, un, the firstborn of an unclean animal, you was to wring its head and, and kill it. So the firstborn of everything. And in fact, 
when we see in Exodus when they entered into the land that or uh, not I'm sorry not in Exodus but uh, anyhow when they entered into the land that the firstborn um the firstborn was used to compensate for the levite which Yahweh took to himself so these people uh, who were the firstborn replaced uh, they're the levites replaced who were the firstborn in the rest of the tribes yeah, I think that goes into detail about how you make redemption for the firstborn of a, say, like a firstborn son. You make redemption for for him, uh, you know, with with the uh, in the priesthood, uh, a shekel or something, uh, whatever it is, uh, that kind of uh, imagery. All right, uh, so I think this might be the last part of our Torah portion. Uh, Helen has a comment there. It reminds me of the firstborn of Adam and his blood poured on the ground. Interesting. Um, yeah, Seth, uh, or I mean, um, uh, it would be Cain and Abel. Abel, Abel, that's what I'm talking about, yeah. Okay, uh, so let's see. Um, yeah, I just did it last. So it was, I think it's Brother James's turn, uh, uh, turn again here. So uh, this section here, I guess, uh, we'll look at we got brother james there observe the month of abib and keep the passover to yahweh your elohim for in the month of abib yahweh your elohim brought you out of egypt by night you shall sacrifice the passover to yahweh your elohim of the flock and of the herd in the place which Yahweh shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. You shall eat no unleavened bread with it. You shall eat unleavened bread with it seven days, even the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. No yeast shall be seen with you in all your borders seven days. Neither shall any of the meat which you sacrifice the first day at evening remain all night until the morning. You may not sacrifice the Passover within any of your gates, which Yahweh your Elohim gives you, but at the place which Yahweh your Elohim shall choose to cause his name to dwell in. There you shall sacrifice the Passover at evening, at the going down of the sun, at the season that you came out of Egypt, you shall roast it and eat it in the place which Yahweh your Elohim chooses. In the morning, you shall return to your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly to Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall do no work. Yeah, uh, a lot of repetition. What is the repetition designed for that you not forget? that you not forget these powerful events that happened or the lessons that came along with those events. I would think of the Passover most notably would be that the fact that Egypt, the entire nation of Egypt, didn't even know who Yahweh was. Pharaoh didn't even know. Uh, and even the children of Israel had largely fallen away from uh, what previous generations had known and had to be chastised at least in the first three plagues, I think it was, before they straightened up and started, uh, you know, serving Yahweh again properly. Um, unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. You know, actually, I've tried uh, unleavened bread that was the softer variety that's homemade. I didn't think there was too much affliction about it, but I guess when you compare it to uh, leavened bread, it's it's less... It's less, uh, you know, uh, everybody likes leavened bread better than unleavened bread, usually, by and large. So, uh, uh, those are my thoughts there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, anything else on this section? It's interesting where it talks about the place where Yahweh Elohim should choose to cause his name to dwell in. Right now in the dispersion. As Brother James mentioned earlier, 
Is Yahweh's name dwelling among a particular people within Messianic faith? Yes, there's a portion. And I actually think that um, well, an that, that understanding of the name opens to their particular keys that open up other things that perhaps uh, to other groups, even of the Messianic faith who don't use the name, uh, are blind to. And I've often thought that, that there are certain truths when you get to a certain level of truth. Um, that uh, opens up other kinds of levels of understanding. Yeah, his name dwells in it, it's his temple. That's a good I, That's a good thought, too. Yeah, you know, you're talking about like even in the DNA. Yeah, uh, those are good thoughts. Okay, um, so I think it's Donna for this last part here. You shall count for yourselves seven weeks. From the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain, you shall begin to count seven weeks. You shall keep the feast of weeks to Yahweh your God with a tribute of a free will offering of your hand, which you shall give according to how Yahweh your El blesses you. You shall rejoice before Yahweh your El, you, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the foreigner, the fatherless and the widow who are among you, in the place where Yahweh your El shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. You shall observe and do these statutes. Um, so so basically you've got Passover and then, uh, so then we're, it doesn't specifically go into first fruits, but it go, jumps right to Shavuot. So it's like the first of the spring and then the last of the spring, right? Uh, it's mentioned here. Here we go. Uh, this is the one I was thinking of. Uh, so uh, I think it's Yehosef. Uh, go ahead and just do that section there. The Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> you shall keep the Feast of Booths seven days after you gathered in from your threshing floor and from your wine press. You shall rejoice in your feast. You, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates. You shall keep the feast to Yahweh your Elohim seven days in the place which Yahweh chooses. Because Yahweh your Elohim will bless you in all your increase and in all the work of your hands, and you shall be altogether joyful. Three times in a year, all of your males shall appear before Yahweh your Elohim in the place which he chooses, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Booths. They shall not appear before Yahweh empty, Every man shall give as he is able, according to Yahweh, your Elohim's blessing, which he has given you. Hallelujah. Yeah, there's that There's that feast I was thinking of. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Brother James. Okay, I know it's gotten a little out of order because we talked about the third tithe first, but this is where the second tithe comes in. Every year we are commanded to keep the, a second tithe so that we have the funds with which to go to this feast. Now, if you figure, uh, and I'm going to, I'm just going to throw out this number. Let's, let's say you make $20,000 a year. Okay. So now you're taking $2,000 to the feast to spend in an eight day period. Now you can live like a king on that $2,000 for a week. And I think that's part of what this is for. But we also have to remember that we are commanded here to not forget those who are less um, able to take care of themselves. The Levite, because he doesn't have a paying job, we were to take care of him. Our male and female servants, because they live off of what we give them, they're not going to have that kind of money. Uh, the foreigner and the fatherless and the widow. These are others 
who may not have the funds to go to the feast with. So that we use that second tithe to make sure that those who are at the feast are taken care of as well. When I first got into Worldwide, um, my first Feast of Tabernacles was kept in Wisconsin Dells in the month of October, which is a cold month, especially in Wisconsin. And I went to that feast with $160 in my pocket and with a, with a new wife. We camped and drove that distance and came back, and I still had $30 in my pocket because the brothers and sisters in our local congregation knew that we went on very little funds. They took care of us. We, they took us out for breakfast. They took us out for supper. They provided for the needs that we did not have, and this was such a great example to me of how Yah's laws take care of our people. And to this day, whenever I go to the feast, I try to make sure that I help somebody else who apparently does not have those kind of funds. Now, sadly, I'm in these latter years since I've retired, I don't have that kind of income to share anymore, but I do whatever I can. And... Um, I just try to make sure that everybody that I'm at the feast with has an enjoyable feast along with us. Yeah, hallelujah. And I've shared some wonderful times with you for, for uh, Tabernacles, uh, Brother James, and uh, it's been a real blessing. Um, yeah, it is a beautiful time. It really is the season of our joy. Uh, and... Um, Really, uh, it's it's about community, isn't it? Uh, it's a lot here about community. Um, and it's very exciting, you know, because you see people from across the country that you don't get to see very often, you know? And you make friends that you didn't even know who these people were, but by the time Sukkot's done, you've made a friend. <laughs> Hallelujah. This, this actually happened with Sister Helen who we met at the feast in Virginia. Yeah, that's right. We saw his Sister Helen and her mother. Yeah. All right. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, okay, so that uh, completes the Torah portion, I believe, the section. And now we are moving into the prophets. Isaiah chapter 54, this is the section here. Uh, I think this might have some correlation with of keeping the commandments and uh, no weapon formed against uh, those who are keeping his ways. All right. You afflicted, tossed with storms and not comforted. Behold, I will set your stones in beautiful colors and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of sparkling jewels, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children will be taught by Yahweh, and your children's peace will be great. You will be established in righteousness. You will be far from oppression, for you will not be afraid, and far from terror, for it shall not come near to you. Behold, they may gather together, but not by me. Whoever gathers together against you will fail or fall because of you. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who fans the coals in the flame and forges a weapon for his work, and I have created the destroyer to destroy. No weapon that is formed against you will prevail, and you will condemn every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of Yahweh's servants. And their righteousness is of me, says Yahweh. What a powerful passage. There's so much in there and so many hope, so much hope for us as his people, Baruch Hashem. I love that. That's a great little passage there. All right. Any thoughts on that? Well, I don't have the uh, the background on this, but I'm I'm sure that this is talking about the age to come uh, during the restoration period. That yeah. because 
today we are far from receiving any kind of blessing such as this. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You know that that what you just read there about you know uh, an enemy not prospering against you. Boy, those sure are words of faith building, because to hear the prophet say that. You know, the people, whether they are able to internalize that and and have that as a faith. Because I want to say there's even, uh, I want to say, is it uh, Jehoshaphat? There was a king that I want to say they had the faith that there was such a great army against them. The faith was, as I think they led the band to lead the, the way to, <laughs> to war. And I want to say with what happened with, you know, the the instruments and the band members leading the way to war, uh, I think Yahweh ended up causing them to flee. If, is my memory right? Am I remembering this yeah, correctly? That, that sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, they were um, the singing. Was it the singing of the Levites and, and all of that? Uh, basically, it, uh, it, it was a miracle. Uh, it caused great fear to come upon the enemy, and and they fleed. They, you know, they. Yeah, may our faith be that strong. Wow. Let's go to Isaiah fifty-five. I think if I did the last one, then it's Brother James got this one. Oh, before we go to Brother James and reading that, uh, here's the other thing that correlates with that: no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Uh, this is in Proverbs twenty-six two. Uh, as the bird by wandering, as a swallow by flying, so a curse without cause shall not alight or shall not come. Okay, so uh, the devil knows that the only way to get a chink in your spiritual armor is to get you to foul up, to come out of the will of Yahweh. Okay, same thing that Balaam told Balak, uh, you know, um, there's no way we can mess these Israelites up because they're protected and they're obedient. But the only way you're going to get them is to get them to be disobedient to your, their Elohim. Uh, and so uh, then the Midianite, remember, they sent their women in and there was a great plague because of that. And Phineas, what his actions stopped the plague. Uh, see, uh, no weapon formed against you means that if you're in the will of Yahweh and you're obeying him, then you're under his protection like a mother hen gathers her chicks and those wings are protective. That's the way Yahweh is in our life. Well, the invitation to the needy. Hey, come, everyone who thirsts to the waters. Come, he who has no money, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which doesn't satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight in its richness. Turn your ear <clears throat> and come to me. Hear, and your soul will live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you don't know, and a nation that didn't know you shall run to you because of Yahweh your Elohim, and for the Kadosh one of Israel, for he has glorified you. Uh, this is uh, reminiscent of what Messiah said, isn't it? That uh, to the woman at the well, that I have water, um, that he who drinks uh, will never be thirsty again. Remember the woman at the well said, oh, tell me where this water is so I don't have to keep coming to the well. Um, uh, this this water, this and remember that water is like life. And so you know, it can be paralleled to being in the presence of Yahweh and in his abiding love and in his protective uh, covering. It's like water. It preserves life. Um, and then, uh, you, know, the, you know, the man and his vanity, you know, they're always uh, 
going uh, to such an extent to try to get something to satisfy the flesh, but the very thing that would satisfy them, they don't want any part of, uh, which is Yahweh and his ways, right? So I get that in here too. Uh, turning your ear, that has to do with teshuva, uh, changing direction from the way you're going and to turn back to Shuba. Come back to him here and your soul will live. And he it promises to make an everlasting covenant with you. And um, there's a lot of there's a lot in here that resonates. Um, resonates many of the principles. All right, so that is the last part of the Torah and the prophet, I think. So now we have the uh, renewed covenant scripture. Um, no, and Yahshua said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not get hungry at all. And he who believes in me shall not get thirsty at all. But I said to you that you have seen me and still do not believe. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I shall by no means cast out. Because I have come down out of heaven not to do my own desire, but the desire of him who sent me. This is the desire of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should not lose it of it, but should raise it in the last day. And this is the desire of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should possess everlasting life, and I shall raise him up in the last day. Therefore, the Yehudim were grumbling against him, because he said, I am the bread which came down out of heaven. And they said, Is not this Yahshua, the son of Yosef, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down out of the heaven? Yeah, and uh, this reminds me of various wayward souls who claim that Yeshua was not preexistent. But notice uh, here, it says here, because I have come down out of heaven. Um, this is another indicator among many in the scriptures that show that Yeshua preexisted. And that when we look at John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. And then we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we see this Aleph Tob uh, idea. And then also in Hebrews it says, he made himself a little lower than the angels. He lowered himself, he humbled himself, even unto death, because... He loved us, and he wanted to provide a way of salvation for us that we might not taste the second death. Go ahead, Brother James. Yeah, bouncing off of what you just read there, because I have come down out of heaven. Notice here, not to do my own desire, but desire of him who sent me. They are not one entity. There are two separate entities here, but they are one family. And this is one of the things so many need to understand that the, the, there is a difference between the father and the son. The father came down or the, the son came down to do the father's work, just as the son was the creator. But he created through the word of Yah. Yeah, good thoughts there, brother. And on you know, on top of that, there's a place in the renewed covenant scriptures where Yeshua says, Look, there's things the Father knows that I don't even know. Like the timing of his return. Yeshua didn't even know the exact timing of his return because only the Father knows that. Remember, he said that about the Father. And then um, even though he said the Father was in me and I'm the Father, he said the Father is greater than I greater than I. So yeah, it's like a family. Uh, yeah, good good thoughts there. Uh, okay, I think uh, this last section here, Yehosef, you want to take that last bit? Uh, starting in what verse again, please? Uh, 43 and continuing on to the end. Okay, thank you. 
And that's Yeshua there in the Hebrew letter. I had to put a different translation in there because the World English Bible uses the Latin to, the Greek to Latin to English, which is Jesus. It uses that. And we, we like to use the proper transliteration of the son's name. Thank you. Then Yahushua answered and said to them, quote, do not grumble with one another. Starting out with another quote. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I shall raise him up in the last day. It has been written in the prophets, and they shall not. It, it was written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by Yah. Is that what that would be? Is yeah, Yah? That's right. Yahweh. Yep. Everyone then who has heard from the Father and learned, come to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who, has, he who is from Elohim. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who believes in me possesses everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that anyone might eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And indeed, the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world, unquote. Yeah, and this has imagery of Passover, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This is idiomatic of Yeshua, that he was the lamb slain uh, from the foundation of the world. Uh, in other words, it was preordained that he should lay his life down in order to redeem the fallen race of Adam. Uh, and uh, the idea of bread and water, these are essential elements for life. Uh, and this is talking about spiritual life, eternal spiritual life. Also, we see in the new Renewed Covenant Scriptures that Yeshua is, is paralleled to the tree of life, by which if you eat of its fruit, you shall never die. So we see imagery like that, too, uh, which remember that Adam and his race were cut off from after they rebelled against Yahweh and his commandment. First Eve and then Adam listening to his wife, they both fell. Brother James. Yes, I was trying to find it real quick, but I couldn't. I believe it's I believe it's in um Shemot 19, but it talks about Elohim calling seven um I think it's 70 elders along with Moshe um, Aharon um, and and uh, Joshua up onto the mountain, and you see in that in that uh, text that they actually sit down and eat with him. Now let's look at what this verse forty six says. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from Elohim. He has seen the Father. So who did these people eat with? Well, of course, they seen with the precarnate Mashiach. This yeah. is something that so many people pass over and don't understand that the Mashiach has been here before his birth on earth. He was here as, as a representative of Elohim and only came as a Mashiach so that he could qualify to be our atonement. Yeah, that's powerful, brother. That is powerful. Brother Yosef, go ahead. <clears throat> in um in some other studies with other friends. Is it possible that Yahshua is actually the archangel Michael? That he and Lucifer but Lucifer didn't actually know that he was the begotten son of Yahweh. 
is I'm putting this out there just as a brainstorm with this group uh, and discussion, maybe briefly. But if yeah. that was the case of whether or not Michael was, um, or shall I say, Yeshua is Michael, and then born into the flesh, and then that was the that was basically um, him lowering himself below the angels by by putting himself into the the temptations of being flesh uh, born. I'm throwing it out there as a question. Thank you. Yeah, and now there, I I do have a, an answer to that, and um, uh, then we'll get what Brother James has to say, but. Uh, there are two groups that do believe that, most notably the the uh, Watchtower Society. I'm not saying that you're of those. I'm just saying that it's it's not a unknown doctrine, okay? And I'm not saying that uh, I'm not making any kind of parallel to you or anything. It's just a question you're asking. To understand that, uh, and also the Mormons believe this. But here's the thing: the Bible says that Yeshua is the only begotten of the Father. So what that tells me is that Yeshua is intricately connected to the family of Elohim, whereas the angels are created. They are not begotten of the Father, because it says Yeshua is the only begotten of the Father, you see. And so uh, and now, if there is any kind of parallel religiously, and I, and I don't bring this up to say that I believe everything in this resource, okay? But there is an interesting concept within Judaism, and they, the concept is Metatron. And the idea is that there is this figure that transcends angelic. It's beyond angelic, that it represents, it is the visible manifestation of the divine, and so uh, that that's the closest uh, outside of any kind of, uh, in other words, uh, that's what I, in, any, in all that I've read, that seems to come closest to what the New Testament seems to be communicating. Uh, and so that's my thought where it says he is the only begotten of the Father. In other words, um, this sets him apart from a created being. And Lucifer was created, remember there's seven archangels seven of them that we know from holy texts. Uh, so, um, and Lucifer was one, but he fell. But he fell. And Michael, and it could be that Michael has replaced him, uh, possibly. I don't know. Maybe Brother James has some thoughts on that. Well, actually, you pretty much took the wind out of my sails here. This is exactly the point that I was going to bring out, that the Mashiach was not created. He was with the Father from the very beginning. He says that himself when he told the uh, Pharisees that he was with Abraham. This was from the beginning. He was with Noah. This was from the beginning. He was the one that Noah spoke with in the garden. Remember, going back here to the verse that we read earlier, none has, has seen the Father except him alone. So who did Noah, or I'm not talking about Noah, I mean Adam. Who did Adam commune with? It was not with the Father. It was with the Mashiach in his precarnate stage. So yes, he was there from the beginning. The, the scriptures are very clear that the angels were created. They were not from the very beginning. They were created to serve Yah. And sadly, one of them rebelled and took with him uh, apparently a third of those Malachim to serve him. And yeah. uh, this is this is really where all of the conspiracy begins, because the conspiracy began with with Lucifer desiring the throne of Yah and trying to take and overcome that throne. Well, we know goodness will always prevail because Abba is, you, is good and righteous, and righteousness will always prevail over evil. Yeah, hallelujah, brother. Those are great, great uh, comments. 
Uh, now, now it's 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 believed that Yeshua is. It says he is uh, those who are in in the priesthood under Yeshua are in the Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, this in Hebrews chapter seven seems to indicate this. Notice that the Melchizedek figure is Yeshua in our time. Now, um, there are some who believe that the Melchizedek that's mentioned in uh, Genesis was the pre-incarnate Yeshua, and there are some who believe that it was Shem, I think, if I remember this correctly. Uh, but be that as it may, it has a curious phraseology in Hebrews chapter 7, where it's definitely speaking of the Melchizedek priesthood holder, the high priest of the Melchizedek is Yeshua, and it says with, uh, he is without father or mother or genealogy. He has neither beginning of days nor end of life. He continues a priest forever. So it seems to indicate that unlike angels who are created beings who have a beginning, at some point they were created, Yeshua has no beginning nor ending. He, he, he is like the Aleph Tav, which has to do with eternal continuity. Eternal continuity. He's the beginning and he's the end. Eternal continuity. Uh, go ahead, Yehoshua. Um, and that is almost a faith of when it says that he is the word. To take that back all the way to Genesis, that when things were spoken into creation, that the words that were spoken came from Yahshua. I don't know if that's a kind of a given with this group, but that's something that I've kind of formed as a in my faith that uh, yeah, though the one who spoke was actually Yahshua. He is the Word, and he spoke all into creation, and maybe even these angels that we're talking about. Yes, yes, hallelujah. Uh, now, interestingly enough, and in, in, it does in a place say that um, where it talks about let us make man in our image, it could be that Yahweh consulted these angels in some way when it says us, or maybe it's talking about the family of Elohim. Because there are many mysterious things. Uh, Paul says great is the mystery of, of Elohim, he uses the term godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. And he goes into detail about this, you know, Yeshua. Uh, some of these things are metaphysical. It's hard to, for the physical mind, our, our, our finite mind to wrap our mind around, you know. Uh, but what we can get from the scriptures are the various things that I believe Brother James has elucidated. And, and I've given my thoughts as well. Go ahead, Brother James. Yeah, so when you referred to, um, uh, you made the reference to Shem being the Melchizedek, that I believe actually came out of the book of Yasher. Now, the problem I have with that is we do not have that original man, uh, manuscript. What we have is translations that have come to us down through the ages. So I do not trust that it has not been manipulated in one way or another and i i still adhere to the to the being of mashiach himself in his precarnate form being that melchizedek yeah good thoughts there brother okay uh so uh that is the um that is the last bit of our torah portion uh today and I have to say, I greatly enjoyed this time with you all. I enjoyed it.